questions. Yeah, so hi, um, I'm Ben. Uh, today I'm going to be doing uh, a quick talk on the Lightning Network. Um, the, the subtitle is a minimal viable product, um, which I'll return to a little bit later on in the presentation. And there will be at the end of the presentation as well, just to kind of keep you all here, there will be an exclusive unveiling of a, a, a cool thing which I've made, um, which I haven't you know, shown to the world yet, so that, that'll happen here as well, so that's quite cool. Um, in the presentation, we're going to be looking at the, the history of the Lightning Network. So what the Lightning Network is, why it's here, um, uh, and what effect it will have on, on, on Bitcoin and how Bitcoin's used and how people interact with Bitcoin. Um, we'll also look at some of the things which are being built on top of uh, the Lightning Network. Um, the, the talk's only going to probably be about half an hour long. Uh, I'll ask as well that if you've got any questions, if you could kind of remember them and then we'll ask them at the end. Um, uh, just so I sort of don't lose my train of thought, you know, which can happen. So without further ado, we shall uh, just jump straight in, I suppose. Okay, so, uh, 1st of November 2008, Satoshi um, uh, airdropped the Bitcoin white paper on the Cypherpunk mailing list, um, in which he proposed a number of solutions for solving some computer science and engineering problems um, on how to make a, a digital, digital cache. Um, uh, so by using things like proof of work, um, he was able to make scarcity uh, and then and, and have a, a working uh, digital cache. So he dropped it on the, the Cypherpunk mailing list and then I suppose anxiously waited for people to respond um, with questions and queries. It didn't happen immediately. Um, I imagine they went away and they read the white paper and thought it through and then kind of thought through some decent questions to ask. The first response was from a guy called James A. Donald. Um, and he said, we very, very much need such a system. But the way I understand your proposal, it doesn't seem to scale to the required size. So the first response by the first person, in the first sentence, he's saying, great system, but it's not going to scale to the required size. And then he goes on to say that if you've got a proof of work token, where um, in order for it to have value, people are going to have to have a copy of the transactions which have happened, um, then it's not going to be able to scale to real world use with hundreds of millions of people using it. So this was the first comment which was made on, um, on, on the Bitcoin white paper. Okay? It was very telling. <coughs> so we're going to start kind of at the, on a very basic level and then work our way up, um, just to fill in any gaps, if people have got any gaps in their knowledge on how Bitcoin works. So we're just going to look at transactions. Okay? So Bitcoin transactions. So when you make a Bitcoin transaction, that transaction is unconfirmed. It hasn't been confirmed. It's not in the blockchain. Okay, so these are transactions, and they're waiting for a bus, and that's a block. One of these comes along every 10 minutes, and then the transactions get on the bus, they get in the block, and then they get hashed into the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay? If there's too many transactions, some of them will have to wait behind, and they'll have to wait for the next block which comes along. Um, and that's more or less you know, how Bitcoin works in a very, this very, 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 very simple uh, uh, way. Um, obviously, there's some issues here. This is the issue with the scaling. So if we have too many transactions and we can't fit them all on the bus and they have to wait for the next bus, then what if that bus is full and then they have to wait for the bus after that? Then you end up with, with the scaling issue. Okay? Um, Satoshi, in his infinite wisdom, in the first release of Bitcoin, uh, he actually had a draft piece of code here. Um, now, Bitcoin, when it first came out, it was actually kind of bloaty. It had loads of functionality in which no one really needed to use. But Satoshi being Satoshi, I suppose he, he realized that that functionality may be useful at some point. So this little bit of code here, okay, so each one of these transactions which has happened, so say this is Bob has made a transaction to Alice in this transaction here, okay? Well, Satoshi said, well, while it's unconfirmed, while it's waiting for a block to arrive, then we could technically update that transaction. So we could change that transaction. So Bob could change, uh, make an update to the transaction while it's unconfirmed before it gets hashed into the block. So that gives kind of a 10 minute window in which a transaction can be changed, okay? Um, which uh, to begin with, this probably just kind of got overlooked as a feature, but then it starts to become explored more and more as we're gonna, we're gonna look at. So how does a transaction work, right? So. Bob's made a transaction to Alice. Again, this is a very simple version of how a transaction works, but this visualization which I made kind of helps me understand it, okay? So Bob's gonna make a transaction to Alice. Bob has a private key, 
and a public key to his wallet. He sends a message, so he makes a message which says, Bob, give Alice this amount, okay? Um, with his private key, he signs that message, yeah? And then he sends Alice some data. He sends her his public key and the signature data and the message. Alice, very quickly, can use Bob's public key to verify that this message is valid and it's actually from Bob and it's a valid transaction, okay? So what Satoshi was proposing was that while these transactions here are waiting, that this data here could be updated by Bob. Um, and that may have some use. And this is interesting because you're kind of building time into a transaction. So uh, this concept kind of got explored. Um, and this is, this is a post off Bitcoin Talk um, by uh, Mike Hearn, um, one of the old core developers on Bitcoin. And he had a private communication with Satoshi. Um, and he was asking Satoshi, so there was this idea that you could extend that functionality of having an updated transaction by putting a time lock in. So a time lock is very, it's like the simplest form of a, a smart contract. So I've got some Bitcoin and I don't want those Bitcoins to be spendable until next week or next month or next year or in 100 years time. Um, I can put a time lock on those Bitcoins so they're not spendable, so you can't spend them. So um, uh, Satoshi explains to Mike Hearn that by using a time lock, um, that unconfirmed transaction where you've got an extra amount of time where you can update that transaction, you could put a time lock in and instead of just having a 10 minute window, you could have a week's window or a two week window or a three week window. And Satoshi said, um, so end lock time was the uh, original function, uh, which was this, a time lock function. As Satoshi said, one use of end lock time is high frequency trades, trades between sets of parties. So if Bob's making lots of trades to, um, I don't know, Bitfinex or something, then rather than those trades be um, go onto the blockchain, if there's lots of small trades, lots of uh, small high frequency trades, then it could just be between Bob and, and, and Bitfinex. Yeah? Um, it's quite nice as well because Mike Hearn at the end here, he says, the end lock feature is not used in Bitcoin today, so this feature was taken out for a whole bunch of security reasons. However, it is apparent that Satoshi considered this use case ahead of time as he did with so many others. So this was really the, ge the genius of Satoshi Nakamoto and the reason we've got Bitcoin is he was able to foresee some of this functionality being useful at some point, okay? Um, so I'm slowly sort of working my way towards uh, where the Lightning Network came from and, and why it's here, yeah? So these are sort of the base concepts. So there's a whole bunch of other um, uh, posts here on Bitcoin Talk. Um, the next time this was kind of discussed was by a guy called Hashcoin, or girl, I don't know. Um, and in that, he said, well, you could use, um, uh, uh, you could set up um, uh, uh, a, a time-locked um, payment channel with another person, and it could be done in such a way that they can't screw each other. So if you've got Bob sending funds, um, what's to stop Bob from broadcasting an old update and not the newest update in that transaction? Yeah? So there's like a big security bug in there. So he kind of starts to think about how that could be possible. A guy took that idea called Jeremy Spillman and he actually knocked together some kind of pseudo code on how that might work. How you could have, me and you could have a payment channel with each other um, and we could do, I could do, I could send you Bitcoin, um, you know, lots of small transactions of Bitcoin and that I couldn't screw you, yeah? Um, that code was then taken by Mike Hearn um, Matt and Matt Carello, who's currently um, a, a core developer. Um, and they implemented it into Bitcoin J. So Bitcoin J was an implementation of Bitcoin, which you could run. Um, and in that implementation, uh, there was the ability to be able to set up one of these payment channels, to, set up a, to, to, to open a transaction with somebody and then not close that transaction, have a time lock in it, so I can do like a high frequency um, uh, updates on those transactions. Um, now the only issue with these concepts was it's, it's one direction. I can only send money to you. Yeah, um, high frequency uh, 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 transactions. Um, uh, Alex Axelrod, uh, he came up in 2014 with a concept of being able to do a bi-directional payment channel. So we set up a payment channel with one another and then I can send you money and you can send me money. So it's an open transaction. It's not 
you know, hashed into the Bitcoin blockchain, and we can send lots of little transactions to each other. So a use case could be, we want to spend the weekend drinking and placing bets. Okay, so we both chuck half a Bitcoin in the pot. Um, I've got half a Bitcoin, you've got half a Bitcoin, and then we flip a coin, and then you know, when I win, I, you give me 0.1 of a Bitcoin, and when you win, I give you 0.1 of a Bitcoin. When we do that all weekend, and then at the end of the weekend then, when the, the time lock runs out, we say, okay, now this is the transaction which is gonna be broadcast to the network. This is the transaction which is gonna be um, hashed into the blockchain, okay? That's gonna be settled. So, um, quite a niche use case, but could be, could be useful uh, for, 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 for something. Now, Axelrod um, extended the idea and he thought, well, if we've got a payment channel set up with one another, and you've got a payment channel set up with somebody else, and they've got a payment channel set up with somebody else, then there could be some way of routing payments through each other. So if I want to send you some money, um, we could have an open transaction, you could have an open transaction, you could have an open transaction, and I could send you money through those open transactions. Um, so this idea of, of building up a, a network of these payment channels started to emerge. Okay? Um, another uh, 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 sort of theoretical implementation which someone was thinking about was AmicoPay, um, of, uh, an excellent project, and that was exploring the same concepts of having these payment channels, these bi-directional payment channels. Um, uh, but there was always a big issue of trust. So how do we trust that we're not going to screw each other, that you're not going to broadcast an old update where you've got more money than me. Um, um, how, do, how, how, do we, how do we get past that trust issue? So it's quite a complicated computer science issue, okay? Um, Christian Decker, he, um, he was the first person to do a PhD in Bitcoin. Um, and for his PhD topic, he chose scaling. And he looked at something he called uh, Bitcoin duplex micropayment channels, which was that, which is setting up these payment channels with, with one another. Um, all three of these ideas, if given more time um, and worked on a little bit more, could have very easily become what we now think of as Lightning Network. Um, people really start to see value in, 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 in uh, a, a, an extra protocol layer which sits on top of Bitcoin where these high frequency transactions could happen off chain. Okay? And around the same sort of time, there started to become a debate around scaling on how best to, to scale Bitcoin. So this was one of, one of the solutions which people thought could be possible. So, 2016, um, uh, the Bitcoin Lightning Network paper, white paper, um, was published by um, uh, Joseph Poon and Theda Streiser. Um, and it's quite a technical white paper because it's a really hard computer science problem to solve. So there's lots of... Um, technical detail, so it's it a very hard document to read, okay? Um, uh, so, but in their proposal, they sort of figured out a way of being able to have a payment channel with one another where we don't have to trust each other, yeah? They figured out a sort of technical hack. So, we've got Bob and Alice again. The original transaction which they started with, they put in 0 0.05 of a Bitcoin each into a pot. And then they do the thing, they make bets with one another. And every time they make a bet, they update um, who's got how many Bitcoin, yeah? Um, so the first bet, you know, Alice wins, and then the bet after that, Bob wins, and then they place another bet, and then Alice wins again. So Bob's not very happy about this, because now he's only got 0 0.2 Bitcoin. Um, and in the, you know, the last round, he had 0 0.8 Bitcoin, uh, 0 0.08 Bitcoin. So he decides to publish this old update in the transaction. So he wants this to be the, the, the update which makes it onto the Bitcoin blockchain, yeah? So what Joseph Poon and Theda Straja suggested was that Alice has proof that she's got a newer update to that transaction. So if she presents that proof, um, uh, she will then get all the funds because it proves that Bob is trying to cheat. Um, so this is a kind of game theory mechanism to stop uh, people from cheating in these, in these uh, payment channels with one another, okay? So, uh, here we go. Um, the Lightning white paper was really complicated and really hard to kind of get your head around. So uh, a Linux kernel developer, a real heavyweight developer called Rusty Russell, um, he got involved. And he broke down the paper into a series of blog articles, which made it more accessible for non-geniuses. Still really complicated stuff, but for you know, non-geniuses could read it and kind of understand it, which is great. 
Um, it also gave a flag to everyone within Bitcoin that if someone like Rusty Russell, who's this world-renowned Linux kernel developer, if he's you know, taken an interest to the Lightning Network, then this thing's got some real validity um, as, a, as a piece of software. Um, now, in order for this to be possible, um, there's actually, there was a bug in Bitcoin. So when we make, say if I open a transaction with you, um, that transaction has an ID. If I then start updating, if we start updating that transaction, then that ID can get affected and can change. So if we've got this channel open and it's been open for a week, a month or a year, then by the end of that month or year, how do we prove that that's the same transaction which we started with? Because the ID for the transaction has changed. So um, that was, an, again, another big computer science problem. How do we solve this issue? So the way in which this came through, this is an update which came through last year, um, we came up with SegWit. So SegWit takes that witness data, okay, and sort of separates it um, in the transaction from the message. So remember before when we had that transaction, you've got the signature data, and then you've got the message inside there. Um, and what this meant was that when we make updates with one another in one of these transactions, um, the, the, um, uh, the ID for that transaction won't change. So it was a big improvement in, in, in the malleability of the, the transaction. Um, it also meant that the blocks, our bus here, if you imagine that these backpacks are the witness data in a transaction, the signatures, we can now put those, uh, that data inside um, this nice storage compartment thing here we've got in our bus, which means we can kind of get more transactions on the bus. This is a very simplified version of how it works, but generally that's the, how the concept works. Okay? The ID for the transaction stays the same, and it improves some scalability. We can get more transactions in each block, which is great. Um, okay, so just to, because obviously this is all quite technical, just to kind of put what the Lightning Network is into context. I have here um, some protocols. So this is, you know, we're all familiar with HTTP, um, but obviously you've got the, the um, Ethernet protocol, and then the IP protocol, and then TCP protocol, and on top of that you've got the HTTP protocol. So the IP protocol is a network layer, the TCP protocol is a transport layer where you can transport packets of data, and then HTTP is kind of an application layer. Yeah? Um, uh, so Bob Kahn uh, invented TCP IP IP in 1973, and then um, it wasn't until 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee came up with HTTP that we then had the, the internet, the modern internet being born. Okay? And obviously from 1989 until the mid-90s when the internet was a thing, um, it didn't really take very long, but the, the time from 1973 to 1989 is a bit, a bit longer. So this idea that now we've got this application layer on top of a transport layer, it means that you can start building all this functionality. Yeah? So other protocols which sit up here, so you've got HTTP, You've also got like SMTP, which is the email protocol. You've got FTP, which is for transferring files, the file transfer protocol. You've got you know, BitTorrent, if you use BitTorrent and you download films or whatever, not illegally, but if you download films or whatever, then that BitTorrent sits there, okay? Um, and Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself um, sits here on top of TCP. Um, so if you imagine that Bitcoin is kind of like this steady um, rock of a protocol layer, um, and then Lightning Network is this application layer which we've built on top. It's a more functional layer. So Bitcoin's great because it's like censorship resistant, it's immutable, um, um, it's really sort of solid, uh, solid base. But then we don't want to be building too much functionality into that protocol. It'd be better and more secure to build functionality into a protocol which sits above it. Yeah? So currently, not currently, um, you can't, I struggled to find a network map of the Lightning Network because it's so big now. Um, so this is, this is an older map of the Lightning Network, and at this point there's like a, I don't know, a thousand nodes running on the Lightning Network, okay? Um, so this is that protocol sitting on top of Bitcoin with all these um, transactions which are opened um, with, with people, and then um, uh, Bitcoin being routed through those transactions. This is all very complicated and confusing, but this might help. Okay, so um, say uh, this is, call this Ben, right? And say Alice has a payment channel open with Ben. Okay, well, Ben has an open channel um, opened with uh, Susan. Okay, 
So if Alice wants to send a payment to Bob, then using these open payment channels, using these open transactions, which aren't closing, Alice can route the payment through these nodes to Bob. So we may have a payment, you know, this may be Alice here, and then Bob might be over here, and the way the protocol works at the moment is if I want to send some Bitcoin through the Lightning Network, um, then it can route through and find the quickest route to this node here. And it does it in a way where um, uh, each node only knows the hop before and after. So by the time the funds actually get to Bob, Bob technically doesn't know that it came from Alice. Yeah, so it, 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 it's actually more um, anonymous. There's more anim anonymity and privacy in Lightning Network than there is on Bitcoin. Because obviously on Bitcoin, you can look at a block explorer and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we have this theoretical concept of this Lightning Network, and yeah, um, uh, but we needed to build um, implementations so people could actually run nodes um, uh, and, and actually build the network. So the first um, implementation was one called C Lightning, and that was by that Christian Decker, the PhD, the guy who did the first PhD in Bitcoin, and Rusty Russell, the Linux kernel developer. They built the first implementation of Lightning uh, Network, um, uh, which is called C Lightning. So basically an implementation is just a piece of software, so you could download C Lightning, and then you can run it, it can, if you've got a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain, um, it can run it and it can, you can use it to send and receive lightning payments, yeah, Bitcoin over lightning. Um, this was the first transaction which happened. Uh, Rusty Russell sold Christian Decker a picture he'd made of a couple of cats, I don't know how much for. Um, shortly after that, I think this was kind of like February this year, so it's already recent stuff, uh, Blockstream, they um, started to sell some of their products um, in their store and you could buy it using Lightning payments. So I could go to the Blockstream's website and I could buy products using Lightning. Um, there was a big disclaimer saying, you know, you may lose funds, this is very uh, experimental, uh, please be careful. Um, and a lot of people in the development community were actually dead against this move because they didn't want people to start putting lots of liquidity, lots of money on the Lightning Network. Because it's still, you know, it's experimental. It's just be, we've just made the thing. We don't know if it's going to work properly. Thankfully, it, it seems to be working okay. Um, Alex Bosworth, he uh, paid for, I think he paid for his like phone bill using, um, he hooked in with BitRefill, which is a service and he was able to pay his phone bill using Lightning, which is pretty cool. This guy here, Laszlo, does anyone know who Laszlo is? Uh, yeah, pizza guy. The pizza guy. So he bought two pizzas. He's the first person to ever do a transaction on Bitcoin. And he bought two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin back in the day. 10,000 Bitcoin. Um, so poetically, he also got in there and he was the first person to buy pizza on the Lightning Network, which is fantastic. It's really good. Um, I'm glad someone else didn't get in there. So. It's important to have different implementations because obviously you don't want just C Lightning to be the only piece of software which people use because then there's some centralization issues. Um, so currently, I mean, there's, there are more implementations you can download and use, but there's three kind of major ones which people use. Um, there's Eclair, written in Scala. There's C Lightning, obviously that's written in C. And then there's L&D by Lightning Labs and that's written in Go. So we've got three different programming languages, three different implementations. Now, technically they're competing with each other. They are. Um, but there's enough sort of governing dynamics between the three that it makes sense to cooperate on, on so, you know, if LND decides that they want to try and screw the other implementations by adding more functionality to their, 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 their implementation, um, it, all it will mean that they'll ostracize themselves on the Lightning Network because other peers on the Lightning Network won't be able to connect to their implementation. So it makes sense that they meet up and they discuss like functionality and how functionality is going to kind of be added in and they give roadmaps onto how they can add functionality into their different um, uh, implementations. So where are we now? Well, we're, we're starting to get some applications which are being built on Lightning. So it's gone from this crazy hard computer science problem to, um, uh, to white paper and a theoretical, uh, the it being theoretically solved to a couple of geniuses actually building the first implementation to a couple of companies actually developing uh, other implementations. And now we have a network. We have this lightning network and it's sat on the top of Bitcoin and people are sending and receiving Bitcoin through it. So we've got a couple of um, like any technology, when you um, uh, give the world a new piece of technology, people will experiment with it and explore new business models and, and whatever and, uh, um, and innovate. 
So here's a couple of examples of some of the things you can do with lightning. So there's that bit reforce thing we spoke about before. This is uh, quite cool, it's called Satoshi's Portal. This is kind of like a big graffiti wall where you can go and you can like, you can draw on it. Another sort of proof of concept idea here, which is pretty cool, is yours. So if you ever hit like uh, a paywall, so say you're reading an article, or you, and it links to another article, like by the New York Times or, I don't know, The Guardian or something, and then you have to pay for a subscription, a monthly subscription to be able to access that article. So this idea is that because you're able to sell very small payments, um, you could potentially just pay per article, which you read. That kind of makes sense. Um, so if we click on an article, uh, so where's the challenge balance stored here? So someone's got an article here, and we can continue reading for half a cent. Is that half a cent? Yeah. Okay. We click here. Hopefully, even though I've got the lines here, it should, um, should be able to read the, uh, the QR code. Let's have a look. It's a bit annoying, isn't it? I bet if I sort of zoom up a little bit, because there is kind of like, here we are. Let's see if that works. Ah, oh, that's annoying. God, it's really annoying. I tell you what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna drag that across. Hold on. I'm gonna drag that across, I'm gonna pay for it on here, and then quickly drag it back, what do you reckon? Right. Okay, so this is for the, the, so I'm going to pay it on here so I can actually see the QR code. There we are. That's obviously a technical issue, which, uh, um, so if I go back to the slide. Sorry, guys. Okay. There we are. Um, there we go. So I've got the payment there, yeah? So it's going to cost me one cent in order to read the rest of this article. I click on pay, okay, and then boom, look at that. It unlocks the article really quick. I didn't have to put any personal details in. It's an anonymous transaction, and I've just paid one cent to get some content over the internet, just like that. Um, so this is, this as a protocol layer, this is functional, it's working, and it's building, um, uh, you know, new industries, and, and people are able to innovate on it. So if you think about currently, um, the way money works on the internet, we haven't got a money native to the internet. We've got Visa Network. Visa Network won't let you take pay microtransactions of a cent or a few cents because their network simply can't handle it um, and it will cost them too much because they've got to run servers and blah, blah, blah. Well, with, so before Bitcoin obviously competed with regular normal currency and Visa Network and all these other payment networks because uh, it's censorship resistant. Nobody owns it, blah, blah, blah. It's immutable. But, you know, speed was, was an issue. Whereas now, uh, with Lightning Network, we're able to send Bitcoin in a way which actually competes with current um, payment networks. Like Visa can't do this, you know? And if they were to allow this functionality, then they're, they're, um, they can do, I think, like 24,000 transactions a second. That would fill up. Um, so it, Visa doesn't scale to be able to facilitate this. Lightning Network scales infinitely. The, the more nodes you have on the network, I think each node, each channel open can do 500 transactions a second. And we've got, I don't know, 10,000 nodes running right now with all these channels open. So um, uh, now Bitcoin can actually compete with those current payment networks um, for speed, um, which, is, which is amazing. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, another, sorry, another service. So um, where are we? Yeah, so we looked at these two. It's pretty cool. Um, there's a, a WordPress plugin. So if you've got a shop on WordPress, you can, you can use it to accept Lightning um, payments. Um, uh, there's a uh, Blockstream, they've upped their game, they've now on their store, they've got a whole range of stickers you can buy for, for Bitcoin Lightning. Um, uh, there's a, this is a really cool service, so I use this, this is, this is great. This is by a company called Async, and they're the ones who had that Bit the, the Lightning implementation Eclair, which you saw before. And um, this is a great service, so currently, uh, if you want to like send and receive Bitcoin over Lightning, then you need to be running you know, a Lightning node. Um, and you have to have a full Bitcoin blockchain on there, and then you have to download an implementation. It's quite fiddly. It's a bit like almost running your own web server, your own email server or something. It's quite technical. So what they do is they kind of simplify the, 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 the process. Um, and you can set up an account with their website. Um, and then in it, you can just start accepting Lightning payments. They have an API, and you can just accept Lightning payments, these tiny little payments for a few cents here, a few cents there. And then when it builds to a significant amount, like a tenner or 20 quid, um, it then just outputs to, a, to a, a regular normal Bitcoin wallet. 
So that's quite a useful way to kind of engage with the system and something, something which I've used. Um, so wallets, so we've got a whole bunch of Bitcoin uh, Lightning wallets which are being developed. Um, so the, 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 the rate of development on, light, on the Lightning protocol is so fast when you think that this thing only went live like at the beginning of the year, you know? It's incredible. So we've got a, a good range of wallets available for Android. Uh, iOS is a bit more fiddly because of the um, Apple App Store, you know, they're a bit more, uh, yeah, uh, restrictive. Um, if you've got an Android phone, Bitcoin Lightning wallet's good. Um, uh, I use Eclair Wallet. Again, that's by the, the people who have the Eclair implementation, and they also have the, the Strike implementation. I just find it really straightforward and simple, and it kind of works. This is Zap. Um, Zap's been developed sort of independently as an open source project. Their um, uh, wallet's really good, really useful. Um, this is another one, Spark, which is by LND, which is the other uh, implementation. Um, so, as, as we've seen, we've built this new functionality on top of Bitcoin which allows these super fast transactions to happen through this network of open transactions. Um, uh, so at the beginning uh, of, the, of, the, of the summer, um, this guy here, Fulmo, Jeff, um, he's heavily involved in the, the Berlin Bitcoin scene. He set up a sort of hack day. So you know, people come together and uh, figure out how we can use this technology, you know, try and build stuff, build some you know, web stuff, build some hardware, whatever. Um, and uh, he'd had some talks as well, so some pretty influential developers have come and talked uh, at his hack days. He did three hack days in Berlin, they were super successful. Um, he also developed this uh, really easy sort of way of, of running your own lightning node, or easier way of running your own lightning node, which I've got here. Um, uh, so you can just, like a Raspberry Pi, and you can just flash an SD card, slam it in there, and then it talks you through the process. I say easy. It's still quite, it's still pretty technical. The last hack day, um, uh, so he did, he's run four hack days in total. The last one, I think he got bored of Berlin, so he decided to do it in New York. And that was pretty cool. We were um, on Wall Street, um, and we're opposite the, you know, the big bull on Wall Street, the big bronze bull thing. I didn't realize, but in front of the bull, there's this little girl sort of standing there, um, staring off the, the, the big bull. And we managed to get this, uh, this like lightning hat on her and get a picture, which is pretty good. Um, uh, but no, some, I mean, some great projects have, have kind of come out of these, come out of these hack days. And it, it very much feels like the beginning of the Bitcoin community. You've got this new thing, and you're not really quite sure what to do with it. You're just like, well, let's just start building stuff and see what happens, you know? Um, this is quite a good story. So uh, on the first hack day in Berlin, they've got a very um, uh, iconic bar called Room 77. And that's the first bar in the world to ever accept Bitcoin. It's where the first mobile phone wallet for Bitcoin was developed because they were fed up of bringing their laptops to the bar to pay for beer. Um, and uh, it's where local Bitcoins, owners use local Bitcoin. That was also developed there. They've got the, the longest running Bitcoin meetup in the world. Um, although yours is pretty good at five years. That's quite impressive. Um, so anyway, Yurik, the guy who, who runs the bar, he's an old school cypherpunk, so he's been in Bitcoin before Bitcoin, you know? Um, and he took a risk at the time, you know, originally when people were, you know, bringing their laptops to the bar to pay for beer, everyone thought, no, one was, it was very, really experimental then, no one thought Bitcoin was gonna be successful. So he took a risk at his bar, I'm sure it's, it's, it's worked out for him. Um, but after the first hack day, we went to the bar for a few beers, and I was chatting to him, and he was so skeptical about uh, Lightning Network. And he was skeptical about scaling because he had the issue of people coming to his bar to pay for beer and then the transaction fees were too high back last year when everyone was buying Bitcoin and whatever and the, the uh, uh, network was being spammed. Uh, so he was really, really like skeptical. Um, so for the next hack day, Rene Picard here and a couple of other developers, they made a really simple point of sale um, uh, program for his, uh, for which Yurik could put on his phone, um, which isn't really starting to the wild because it's so experimental, but it works. Um, and that meant that Yurik could start accepting um, Lightning Network payments for beer. So we all went to the bar then and started buying beer from him using the Lightning Network. And like he was, his eyes lit up. You know when he saw like we just saw then when you make a payment and. It's instant, you know, it's, 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 and it didn't cost you anything um, in fees. And then at seven in the morning, I was like the sixth person to buy beer on the Lightning Network at his bar. Um, sixth person in the world, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, he was in the corner, and he's hacking away on his laptop like this, and he's producing this Reddit post. 
And it, it was nice because he's so skeptical, but he says, the scaling debate's over. At the Berlin hack day this weekend, some reckless people implemented a point of sale solution on mobile devices that allows us to accept Bitcoin via the Lightning Network at our bar room 77. So he went from being like a skeptical old school Bitcoiner um, to somebody who is, you know, he sold. You know, he thought this is this is it. This this works. This is a, this is the application layer for Bitcoin, where people can actually start building stuff and getting excited. Um, in the last hack day, uh, Christian Decker. This is Christian Decker, the, the guy who did the Bitcoin PhD, um, so, and also wrote C Lightning as well. I asked him a question. So at the moment, Lightning's restricted. Like the functionality of Lightning is kind of restricted in that if I want to send um, you a payment, you have to generate an invoice and then make a QR code and then I, I scan that QR code and I send you a payment. But then once that QR code's used, then you have to generate a new QR code. And to me this finally feels clunky, like it'd be nice to just have a static QR code and I could just send you as many payments as I want on that QR code. Um, so he said this is something which we're looking at and this is something we're working on and he said um, we wanted, with, regarding the Lightning Network, we wanted to have a minimal viable product before we started tagging on features. So we look at all this functionality, we look at the speed in which you can make transactions on the Lightning Network, we look at all this innovation which is happening, and that's still on a minimal viable product. Like, the functionality of what Lightning could provide hasn't even been added yet, it's not even been tagged on. So, you know, the idea of being able to stream money, you know, that, that will happen through Lightning. So you could pay for a service by the second. And when you imagine a world with, you know, Internet of Things, with all these devices communicating and sending value to one another, then we need a native uh, uh, currency which lives on the Internet, which, could, which can facilitate um, uh, that. I'm, I'm happy as well here that I, I, I got a, uh, a screen grab um, of his talk. Um, but th this was a really interesting slide because, like I was saying before, where you've got Bitcoin as a protocol and then you've got Lightning Network as another protocol which sits on top of it. Actually, the Lightning Network is also a, 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 a layers, um, a built into layers. So that original game theory, um, if you try and publish an older version of our transaction, I can take all the funds in the channel. Um, that's the LM penalty here. Actually, that process could be done in a whole bunch of different ways. And you can actually build those into the Lightning Network protocol and you can have a whole bunch of different ways of updating um, uh, uh, and securing those channels. Um, and the way in which Lightning's been made, that functionality can very easily be added. So I think they've had you know, 10 years of working with clunky old Bitcoin, which is really hard to innovate on, and they've built this protocol um, so, it's, so it's much easier to kind of you know, get their hands in and actually start making it more functional. So, um, while I was there at the, at the hack days, I've shown a couple of you this. Um, my little project which I made uh, was the, uh, the sweet machine. So before there was physical devices people had made to, where you could pay for something using Lightning Network, but they would have like a full node running inside a sweet machine. And that's like, you know, it's got a whole Bitcoin blockchain on it. Um, you've, got to, you've got to like make payment channels with people so you're actually visible on the network and it's, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. So I thought, actually, something like a sweet machine would be a slave device. This is a master, and you would have, because I can do 500 transactions a second, that would have lots of devices, slave devices, connecting to it. So that was the motivation for this. I called it 1.21 after, you know, Back to the Future, because that was pretty cool. I also thought um, real-world merchants, like I said before, they're unlikely to run their own email server or their own web server, so why would they run one of these things? Actually, they'd probably use something a bit like Strike, where you can send lightning payments and then it outputs. So a real-world merchant could have a hardware wallet, like a Trezor, and then lightning payments could be sent to Strike, they could concatenate and then spit out to your hardware wallet, and then all which is at risk is maybe 20, 30 quid actually on Strike. Um, so that's the, the security trade-off. So this is how it works. So it's I turn it on, it gets an invoice from Strike, converts it to a QR code, which is a pain in the ass, displays the QR code on the e-paper module, has the invoice been paid? It's just asking Strike, has the invoice been paid? No, it just loops around, yes, turns GPIO on, and then it spits out the suites. So, um, yeah, I, I used a, a very simple, cheap hardware, so this is about, which well, is actually under, under 15 quid's worth of hardware here to make it, like a little Arduino board, a little e-paper display thing. Um, and a little NPN resistor, really simple module, you know, you could stick it in a whole range of different things. So now is the time where I'm going to, um, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to show you the new thing which I've, uh, I've built. 
uh, uh, the new little bit of hardware, which I think is pretty cool. Again, super simple. I'm an imbecile. Um, so, so, you know, I was pretty impressed that I was able to... Oh, here we are. Here's the, here's the music to build up for the, the grand unveiling. <laughs> so I'm obviously sticking with the Back to the Future theme, you know? <laughs> there we are. So you gonna finish? It's gonna play the whole song, is it? Right, so, the flux capacitor. <laughs> so this is the flux capacitor right here. So I've basically taken that concept of having a sweep machine with a, um, an e-paper module, um, which we can display a QR code, and I've just added like an adhesive, this is a pound, this little keypad thing, like an adhesive keypad, and then plugged that into the little Arduino module. And that means that I can input in there, so say if I want to pay 63 Satoshis for something, okay, I hit the, the hashtag here, that sends, the, the 63 to strike, strike sends back an invoice, it generates a QR code on there, and then I'm able to get, <laughs> I scan the QR code, hopefully this will work, I click on pay, and then it's checking, there we are, I get feedback saying the person's paid, and then it just refreshes so you can input another amount. So this is that, so that's like 15 quid's worth of hardware, plus a two quid box and like a pound or two pound little keypad plugged into it. But if you, gave, if you give a merchant this, so someone in a bar or a cafe or someone in a shop, people can pay using Lightning in their shop and all they need is this, an account with Strike, that custodial thing, and then somewhere to send the Bitcoin when it concatenates together. You know? So it's a real cheap way to kind of like for somebody who wants to be able to accept Bitcoin, accept Lightning in their shop to be able to do it without having to fiddle around too much. Um, I kind of went with the Back to the Future theme because, as we were saying before, with the, uh, the, the, the Lightning came about because there's this, there's this time element built into transactions. So originally it was that 10 minute time element where you could update a transaction. And then people use these time locks to, to extend the time in which you can update those transactions. So to me, Back to the Future kind of made sense because it's, it's all about energy, using energy and, and time as well. There's this time element in there and also it's a bit goofy and fun. So, so there we are. I hope I don't get sued by whoever makes Back to the Future, but that, that is the flux capacitor. This is the grand unveiling, never been seen before in the world. Um, so what's quite, What's quite cool is that, like, you know, I'm an imbecile when it comes to developing and stuff. This is just me spending a lot of time. It's just me throwing dirt at a wall and eventually it's sticking. Um, uh, I'm able, because this is a fringe technology and not many people are involved in building stuff on it, I'm able to make something which is useful that, that nowhere else in the world can you pay instantly um, uh, in a censorship resistant way using a device like this apart from in this room. You know, you can, there are other places where you, you know, they'll have a node running or something where you can pay for something. But the, the, this, this device, this little like um, purpose built device, a lot like a card machine or whatever, um, this doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And that's cool that like we've got that here right now and like, you know, we're innovating. Um, we're on the fringe of, 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 of innovation. So that's pretty cool. That's the end of the, the, the talk. It was a bit of a whirlwind, so I apologize, but thank you, thank you, thank you very much.